behalf of the Attitude team, I would like to thank you for joining today's ADHD Experts webinar titled When Dyslexia and ADHD Overlap, Symptoms, Misconceptions, and Interventions. Dyslexia is a language-based learning disability characterized by difficulties with reading and spelling. Dyslexia occurs in up to 17% 17 of people with ADHD, but it can also be confused for ADHD. Though the two conditions do share some common traits, they are distinct and require different treatment approaches. Today's webinar will explore the similarities and differences between ADHD and dyslexia. We'll discuss effective interventions for children with both conditions and how these strategies differ from those used with students who have either ADHD or dyslexia. Leading today's presentation is Dr. Cheryl Chase. Dr. Chase is a licensed clinical psychologist in private practice near Cleveland, Ohio. She specializes in the diagnostic and neuropsychological assessment of various conditions affecting children, adolescents, and young adults, including ADHD, pervasive developmental disorders, learning disorders, and emotional concerns. In addition to her clinical practice, Dr. Chase is also an accomplished speaker at the local and national levels, leading workshops on executive functioning, dyslexia, and dysgraphia, and on creative ways to support those who struggle in school. Finally, Dr. Chase serves as an adjunct instructor at several colleges in the Cleveland area. She's an active member of the International Dyslexia Association, the American Psychological Association, and the Learning Disabilities Association of America. Before I hand over the microphone to Dr. Chase, I have just a few housekeeping items. Those of you tuned in to the live webinar may submit questions for Dr. Chase at any time by navigating to the text box under the video player. To download the slides, click on the event resource section of your webinar screen. And if you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you'll receive about an hour after the live broadcast. If you're listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast number 403 to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine. Subscribe now to receive our summer issue, which includes a summer reading roundup for neurodivergent kids plus articles on fun summer activities to keep kids learning and expert advice on medication vacations. Finally, the sponsor of this webinar is Acetrate. Acetrate is a dietary supplement formulated to address nutritional deficiencies known to be associated with ADHD. It contains omega-3 fatty acids in phospholipid form, the form already in the brain. This brain-ready nutrition helps manage inattention, lack of focus, emotional dysregulation, and hyperactivity without drug-like side effects. Visit www.phoenixhealthscience.com to learn more. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. So without further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. Chase. Thank you so much for joining us today and for leading this discussion. Great, thank you so much for having me and thank you all for joining us today. It's a really interesting series of topics that we're gonna be covering today, dyslexia and ADHD. There's a great deal of overlap, but they are very distinct conditions. I invite you to drop whatever questions you have in the chat and we will be making time for questions at the end. Thank you so much Attitude for having me. So quick introduction, ADHD, most of you know what this is. ADHD and dyslexia though are separate conditions and they do often co-occur in the same person. It's estimated that about 50 to 60% of people who have ADHD also have a learning disorder. And the most common of those learning disorders is dyslexia. 
ADHD is characterized by inattention, distractibility, hyperactivity, and impulsivity, whereas dyslexia is a language-based learning disability characterized by difficulties with accurate and fluent word recognition, spelling, and decoding. I'm gonna dig into that definition in a little bit. So although these two share some common traits, they are distinctly different. And unfortunately, often, especially in my experience in students who have a diagnosis of ADHD, the digging in and looking for the reading disorder is often overlooked. Proper assessment to identify both of these conditions then is going to be critical. Critical. So, so what is ADHD? What is ADHD, as most of you know, stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. It's a horrible name for this condition, and I'll explain why. A complex brain disorder that's a developmental impairment in what we call the executive functioning, so the conductor of the brain, the part of the brain that kind of tells the rest of the brain when it needs what it needs, when to do what it needs it to do. So even Barkley, Mr. Dr. Russ Barkley, the, the sort of king of ADHD who really defined this disorder will say that it's a horrible name for this condition. It's not like you don't have enough attention. You don't have attention in a bucket and carry it around with you. It's actually a problem with the executive functions. It's about timing, rate, pace, and the way that the brain processes information. Folks with ADHD have trouble with impulse control, focusing and organizing. And ADHD is a developmental impairment of the brain's self-management. Things we do to ourselves, for ourselves, by ourselves, privately to meet a goal, stay on task. And both children and adults can be diagnosed with this condition. As you know, that's from attitude. So <clears throat> according to the DSM, our sort of diagnosing Bible, so to speak, uh, there are two symptom clusters in ADHD. The first symptom cluster is going to be those um, symptoms that have to do with inattention. The second symptom cluster has to do with those that are associated with hyperactivity or impulsivity. You have to have six or more of one cluster and or six or more of the other cluster, five or more, by the way, if you're an adult to be diagnosed with a condition. And it has to have been around for at least six months to a degree that's kind of getting in the way of life. I'm just gonna review these symptoms quickly because I wanna spend more time on dyslexia. Fail to give close attention to detail. Difficulty paying attention for a long period of time. Doesn't appear to listen to. Uh, listen to you, listen to what's being said to them, listen to a conversation. Struggles to follow through on instructions. Difficulty getting organized and staying organized. Avoiding tasks that require a lot of mental effort. Losing things, keys, cell phones, notebooks. Easily distracted by other things going on around or by things going on up here. And then forgetful in everyday activities. So this symptom cluster is one grouping of symptoms. Or another cluster of symptoms Fidget with hands and feet or squirm in seat. Difficulty remaining seated when you should remain seated. So I'll ask patients about things like, do you like going to the movies? How about going out to dinner? How about church? How about going to the theater? And a lot of times they'll say to me, oh, absolutely not. I watch movies at home. Run about or climb too much in children and in adults, just this feeling like I am restless and I gotta get out of here. Difficulty engaging in leisure activities quietly. Acts as if driven by a motor or adults will feel like they're driven by a motor inside. Talk too much. Flirt out answers before the question's been completely asked. Difficulty waiting your turn or difficulty taking turns, whether it be a conversation or on the playground. Interrupt or intrude on others, kind of butt in the conversations. So this second symptom cluster is more the hyperactivity impulsivity symptom cluster. So we also need to have some, some symptoms, it doesn't have to be six or six, present before age 12, because this is a developmental condition. We expect that it was there since childhood. Several symptoms in at least two or more settings. You're not only ADHD at school. It has to be seen in at least two settings, not all the symptoms, but some. Clear evidence that is getting in the way of your functioning. So it's one thing to just kind of 
be talkative, but we need to have evidence that it actually interferes with functioning. And then it's not better explained by some other condition, like an anxiety disorder or an autism spectrum disorder or some other developmental disorder. That's really where a lot of my work is in my evaluations, is making sure that these symptoms are not better explained by an anxiety condition or a depression condition or a trauma background. So there are three primary presentations. You can have one symptom cluster, six or more of one symptom cluster, so predominantly hyperactive impulsive presentation or predominantly inattentive presentation, or you can have six of one and six of the other, and that would be the combined presentation. Okay, so that's kind of defining what is ADHD. What are we talking about? And I'm pretty strict with the DSM criteria. There are certainly plenty of things that are also associated with ADHD, but in terms of coming to my office, working with me, getting this diagnosis, these are the 18 symptoms that I'm looking for in our DSM. So what about dyslexia? I will warn you, this is a very wordy definition, but we will break it down. So let's go over the whole thing first. Dyslexia is a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin. It is characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. These difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language that is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities and the provision of effective classroom instruction. Secondary consequences may include problems in reading comprehension and reduced reading experience that can impede growth of vocabulary and background knowledge. So take a second and look at this. This definition was first, I, um, was first defined in 2002. So it's only been about 20 years that we've had a clearly defined definition of dyslexia. Certainly lots of research teams had their own definitions and certainly a lot of people had what they thought was a definition, but it wasn't until 2002 that IDA really hammered down a specific definition, which we're gonna break down in a minute. The fact that it only came out in 2002 is important, and I'll echo back to this in a few minutes. Okay, so let's break it down. Dyslexia is a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin. Specific meaning that it impacts language processing versus being a global weakness in everything. It is not a weakness in math and writing and reading and processing speed and working memory. We're talking about a specific area of impact. Learning, meaning the acquisition of being able to um, read, write, whatever. But in terms of specific learning disability with dyslexia, we're talking about the reading process. And it's a disability, meaning that it does actually have a functional impact. That's a big term when it comes to legalese. We have to show that something is not just present, like a wart on your toe, like wow, yeah, ew, that thing's a problem. The doctor diagnosed it. I have to get some treatment for it. But is a wart on your toe disabling? It can be if you're a ballerina, but probably not if you're a psychologist like me and just going to the office and seeing patients. So you have to show that it actually interferes with or limits a major life activity. And it's neurobiological in origin. We're talking about how the brain and the brain chemistry and the cells of the brain function. It's characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition, poor spelling and decoding abilities. So accurate and or fluent, it is certainly possible to read accurately, but to be really slow. And that's what often what we see in a dyslexic who has been identified and treated. So a remediated dyslexic will still likely remain slow. Word recognition. So recognizing words that are written quickly and smoothly. So think back when you were learning how to drive. Do you remember how difficult it was trying to remember, oh, first I have to put the car in reverse. No, wait, I have to depress the brake in order to put the car in reverse. Wait, but I forgot my seatbelt, right? Everything felt so effortful. And you wonder, how am I ever going to be able to do this? And now perhaps you're a very fluent driver and you get to your destination and you realize, I didn't even, did I stop at the stop sign? And you're able to 
you know, play with the radio or, you know, maybe even have a conversation with a friend on the phone while you're driving because you became fluent. So you practiced it to the point where you mastered it and you're able to do it fluently. Fluency is critical for reading because if you can't read fluently, you can't hold everything in mind enough to comprehend what you're reading, like the beginning of the sentence to link it to the end of the sentence. If everything is so effortful, word by word by word, you're unlocking the code as you're going along, it's very difficult to comprehend and string together those words into a meaningful sentence. Spelling. So yes, we definitely see weaknesses in spelling in those with dyslexia. Now, it's not mandatory to make the diagnosis, but we pretty much see it. Now, if you think of it this way, I am looking at a page that has these squiggles on paper that I call letters. I have to turn those letters into sounds in my mind's ear so that I can decode what I'm reading, turn those squiggles into sounds, put those sounds together, and then recognize the word that I'm reading. That's the reading process. The spelling process is that in reverse. I have the sounds in my mind's ear, and I need to deconstruct that, think of what, squ what sounds I'm trying to um, capture, what squiggles, which we call letters, make those sounds, and then what is the way that I write that out on paper. So reading is coming in and spelling is going out, but it's a similar process. It's not universally true that they're both impacted, but it's almost universally true that they're both impacted. And then decoding, as I said, the process of translating print into speech by rapidly matching a letter or combinations of letters, which we call graphemes, to the sounds that those letters make and recognizing those patterns that make syllables and then words and then recognizing those words. These difficulties typically result from a deficit in what we call the phonological component of language. So a phoneme is any of the perceptibly different or perceptually distinct units of sound in a specific language that distinguishes one word from another word. Now, phonemes are not letters because you can have letter blends or you can have one letter that makes multiple sounds like the vowels, they're so difficult, right? You can have long or short. But just for example, the word bat and hat have different phonemes at the beginning, b and h. And so the phoneme is a different phoneme, a different sound, means a different word or different meaning. Obviously a bat is very different than a hat or pan and pet. The n versus the t. Pan is something very different than hat. So those are examples of different phonemes. Now English has 44 phonemes. Other languages have different numbers. Um, as I said, because the vowels can make multiple sounds and we have 26 letters, but then we can put letters together like th, that's a distinct sound that is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities and the provision of effective classroom instruction. Unexpected in relation to, it means that this area of weakness stands out. Kids are capable of doing so many other things in so many other areas, and yet their reading kind of is a head scratcher. And you'll hear story after story of successful dyslexics who will say, my mom picked it up early. She knew I was capable because conversationally or intellectually, or I could go in the garage and take apart toasters and put them back together by the time I was eight years old, but I couldn't read. And so the expression that is used in the field is, is an island of weakness in a sea of strengths. And what's this effective classroom instruction? Well, attempts have been made to teach the child how to read through conventional means, and yet they're still not able to read as fluently and easily and at grade level or whatnot as we would expect them to. So that's what we mean by that definition, the unexpected meaning it stands out in relation to their other skill areas. And we have to assume that there was some effective classroom instruction that was attempted. This is really important when we're talking about defining it for purposes of school or um, uh, disability determination. They had to have been tried to be taught how to read at some point. And these secondary consequences may include problems with reading comprehension. So they don't understand what they're reading because reading is so labored and difficult. 
and reduced reading experience that can impede growth of vocabulary and background knowledge. This reduced reading experience means they're less likely to read. And so they're less likely to read, therefore developing less vocabulary and knowledge acquisition because of it. Okay, so we know what we're talking about when we're talking about ADHD. We know what we're talking about now when we're talking about dyslexia. Um, so if ADHD is about inattention and impulse control and dyslexia is about reading, then I mean, it doesn't sound like people could confuse them very much. And I will tell you that I fell into this camp when I first started practicing. To me, it was obvious when a child had one or the other. But then I realized that that was after I knew what the diagnosis was. When you're going into a situation and you don't know what's going on with a kiddo, it is definitely easy to get them mixed up or to not really know where the boundaries are or to see one and let that kind of hijack your diagnostic image versus maybe seeing both. So let's go into that a little bit more. Sip of water. So why might they get confused? Well, first of all, both run in families. About a half to a third of cases, genetics plays a part. So if a child is diagnosed, with, or if a parent is diagnosed with ADHD, there's a good likelihood, like a half to a third likelihood that one of their kids will be diagnosed with ADHD. Same thing with dyslexia. They're highly, highly heritable. And they can co-occur often. So people don't exactly know which symptoms are due to which one. And I see this all the time, all the time in my private practice. I will have an adult who will come to me and say, you know, I wanna go to, just had this medical school, and I really didn't do great in school, but you know, I'm in my 30s now and I, I really wanna go back to medical school. And I just feel like ADHD is kind of always gonna be in the way. Uh, I'm sorry, let's go with dyslexia. I feel like dyslexia is always gonna be in the way. My dad had dyslexia and you know, school was always hard for me and stuff. Um, so I think dyslexia is always gonna get in the way. And when I do an evaluation, it turns out that there is a reading disorder, but there's also ADHD. But I also see it the other way where I was pegged as having ADHD early on because that's what my brother had and my mom has it, but no one ever really did a deeper evaluation to see if I also maybe had difficulty with reading. All of my school problems were chalked up to the ADHD or chalked up to dyslexia without anybody really getting in there and looking at what else might be going on. Both conditions are misunderstood, even in this day and age. For example, a kiddo struggling in school is sometimes just globally called dyslexic. I actually did an evaluation, <coughs> I'm trying to think, maybe 10 or 15 years ago now, of a young woman who was evaluated by a dyslexia specialist, by the way, prior to 2002. So this dyslexia specialist back in the 1980s would have been more of just kind of a learning specialist. And so this dyslexia specialist wrote a really long report and diagnosed everything as dyslexia. But as I dug into the report, there was an interesting sentence in there. Susie has dyslexia, but she has her own unique kind of dyslexia. She's actually a really strong reader. She struggles with, and then named all of these things that are much more consistent with the diagnosis of maybe a bad working memory or you know, poor working memory. And so it was really challenging to try to say to this woman that I know for like 30 years, you've thought you've had dyslexia, but dyslexia is a reading disorder and you read just fine. And so for a long time, anytime a kiddo struggled at school or you know, a young adult struggled at school, the, um, the label of dyslexia was put on there. And in fact, you'll even hear people say, I have math dyslexia. And I just, you have what now? Math dyslexia. So it's a little bit challenging when the term dyslexia has been so broadly used. Now, since 2002, we're starting to really be able to kind of make a, a, a little bit more headway now that we have a firmer definition. So only recently did the field develop a universal definition. But by the way, I think many of you probably are aware of this. There's a big stigma to it as well. So there might be a stigma around ADHD, or there might be a stigma around dyslexia. And so again, uh, an evaluator or somebody working with a child or the school might want to just kind of call it dyslexia because they don't necessarily want to put ADHD in the documentation. That's very unfortunate. 
A third reason it's easy to get the two mixed up, impulsive and inattentive children are hard to test. They're just hard to test. So sometimes the evaluator stops or doesn't really know how to interpret the scores because of the behavioral observations made during testing. So let me give you an example. <clears throat> I had a boy in my office a few months ago and he really, really struggled to comply with testing. Um, he wanted to, I mean, he, he was interested in being there. Um, but he really struggled to kind of sit across from me and do the turn taking and kind of wanted to go on his own agenda. And so as I was trying to get him to do phonological awareness testing, the stuff I really wanted to know, is this kiddo dyslexic? We kind of know he's got some behavior issues. Is he dyslexic? He pushed hard against doing that kind of testing. Despite my best efforts, I had stickers and star charts and toys and things he could earn. We took lots of breaks and had snacks and walked outside for a little bit. Then we came back and every time we tried to re-engage, it was really, really hard for him. And it just kind of makes you wonder why in particular is doing this reading stuff, something that you are so resistant to do. And so I had the parents bring him back at a separate time and that's all we did. We did 30 solid minutes of just reading testing with a big reward at the end. And turns out it was really, really hard for him. But I've seen it the other way. I've seen it where I have a student who's identified with dyslexia and I wanna do some executive function testing. I wanna look at some of those things that are associated with ADHD. And the student becomes incredibly oppositional when I'm trying to do working memory testing, for example. And it's really easy to say, well, you know, I'm not really gonna go on with this any further. I, I can't get any meaningful data. And so stopping. And so you just start with that diagnosis that you kind of can slam dunk that you know for sure is there and then don't dig any further. And it's a major disservice to the kiddo. It's a major disservice to the young adult or to the adult. <clears throat> and so in many circumstances, particularly if the child is inattentive, impulsive, hyperactive, they're not easy to test. It's very easy to just kind of stop there and say, well, I tried to do phonological testing. I tried to do reading testing, but he was so impulsive or hyperactive or resistant that I don't know what the results are telling me. Yeah, the scores are low, but it's probably more reflective of the inattention. That's not necessarily true. What about your other data? How was his math? How was his um, you know, writing? How was his um, other things that you asked him to do that weren't particularly difficult for him? So I start out with just some games with the kids. Like, can you do a back and forth game? Can you play cards with me? Huh, okay. So you can sit for a half hour and play some cards or you know, 20 minutes and play a board game with me. But as soon as I ask you to decode words, I see a different kiddo in front of me. So that's just a way that I can start teasing apart. Maybe the resistance is because what I'm asking him to do is so hard versus because he's resistant across the board. Both can show up as difficulty paying attention, but ADHD is gonna be a more global difficulty paying attention. Whereas dyslexia is more when reading and uh, language demands are high. Now, one thing I didn't go into extensively, but I will encourage you with some resources at the end, dyslexia is actually a broad language processing issue. It is not just print-based. And so uh, the phonological piece is important in understanding and using language verbally as well, orally. So it is possible that in a language heavy classroom with a teacher who talks an awful lot with parenthetical phrases and um, you know, um, if then caveats and things like that, that the child could tune out. And so the child looks like they're inattentive, not paying attention, not focusing. Oh, they must have ADHD when in fact it's more of a language processing issue or a dyslexia issue. Or maybe the child's oral language is okay but now they're sitting with a worksheet in front of them, or they are supposed to be uh, writing their spelling words or reading silently at their desk or reading off the board or reading along with the teacher at the board. And the student can't do what is asked of him or her. And so the student then says, yeah, I'm gonna look around. Oh, how many holes are in that? They're doing anything other than. And the example I like to say to parents is, imagine going to a church service or a movie where it's all done in a language you don't speak. Are you paying attention? Are you thinking in your head about other things you wanna get done today? 
Are you making your to-do list? Are you thinking about a conversation you had the other day? You start fiddling with your phone. You start doodling on paper. So if you are at something that is a half an hour or 45 minutes long, and they're speaking a language that you don't really understand, you would tune out as well. So kids with language processing issues, kids with dyslexia will look inattentive in many environments. First of all, reading's hard and they fatigue as well. So another piece is that they might be able to do some reading, but if they're doing reading all school day or they're expected to read silently for 15 minutes at their desk or something like that, their brain is working harder than a non-dyslexic brain. So even if they can engage for short periods of time, they fatigue. And then, as I said here, if a child can't do a worksheet or do silent reading, for example, he's going to look very off task. But remember, ADHD is going to be a more global impulsivity and inattention, whereas dyslexia is going to be more in language heavy or reading heavy environments. Both students with ADHD or students with dyslexia can guess at words, but ADHD is more of an impulsive, whereas dyslexia, they can't unlock the code. So even if you can get them to break down the word and you're asking them what the different sounds are in the word, what letters the sounds make, or you're able to cover part of the word and remove your cover of that part of the word as you go along, they're going to struggle to unlock the code. Kids with ADHD are just more impulsive at guessing what it must mean and moving on. Both can struggle with reading, but different aspects of reading. Those with ADHD can sound out the words accurately, but as they're reading, they're gonna skip over smaller words. They might skip punctuation. They might lose their place. They might have a random thought that comes in and then they, they're sort of off thinking about the random thought instead of remaining on task. Kids with dyslexia are gonna struggle with accurately reading even smaller words. And then both might struggle with comprehension. Those with ADHD because they're skipping punctuation, they're guessing at words, they're hopping over small words, and they don't have the mental counter space, the working memory to hold in mind everything they need while they're reading. So I do a whole series of talks on reading comprehension and ADHD, which I'll, <coughs> I'll hint at here in a minute or two. But the bottom line is, do you have the mental capacity to hold in mind the beginning of my sentence to link it up with the end of my sentence to string together for meaning? Or are you able, imagine reading something like, I don't know, Beauty and the Beast, and it talks about a rose, or it talks about uh, Lumiere, right? So you're reading and you're thinking, what does a rose have to do with any of this? Your working memory needs to go into your long-term memory and pull down what significance those petals of the rose have in the story of Beauty and the Beast, or the different characters' names, or other books where they kind of foreshadow or they may um, have alliteration or they may have. So there are things that go on in a literary story that require holding a lot in mind at the same time and not just unlocking the code of words. Kids with ADHD may struggle with reading comprehension for that reason. Kids with dyslexia will struggle with reading comprehension because they're not reading the words accurately or they're not reading every word at all. It's impossible to comprehend what you can't read, what you can't unlock. Both kids, those with ADHD or dyslexia may avoid reading because reading's hard and it requires a lot of mental effort. And then both may struggle with different aspects of writing. Both may show problems with organization, with proofreading, with kind of planning ahead, but folks with dyslexia are also gonna struggle with the spelling. So you're looking at, uh, one of the things I like to do is I have parents send me work samples and I'm looking for spelling. And then both may just globally underachieve in school. And this is where I often see, um, especially in adults who come to me for the first time or college students who come to me for the first time, they were underachievers at school and they always chalked it up to one or the other. Or unfortunately, oh, it just breaks my heart when it's, I was a lazy kid, or I wasn't really motivated, or I was a problem kid, or I wasn't really bright, um, or some global other definition that has to do with sort of your constitutional makeup rather than the fact that maybe you had a learning disability or ADHD that were undiagnosed. Okay, so you can see why there may be uh, an inability to kind of clearly notice that a child may have both conditions. And that when one is present, it often is sort of used as the scapegoat for all the symptoms that we're seeing. 
And, and I'm, I'm telling you, I see this in my practice with some frequency. It's really very frustrating. So what do you do? What do you do if you have a kiddo or you yourself think that maybe, maybe you have both, or maybe you have a diagnosis of ADHD, but it doesn't really seem to explain everything that you struggle with. What do you do? Number one, I can't stress this enough, a thorough evaluation from someone who understands both conditions. Be very upfront about your concern that maybe both conditions are there. And maybe we can break up testing over time so that the evaluator isn't saying, well, I'm gonna try to shoehorn it all in one eight hour day or one six hour day or one four hour day. And then by the end of testing, they're saying they can't really draw conclusions about reading because the child was so inattentive or whatnot. So <clears throat> the one thing I do is I ask parents right up front. First of all, if the child is young, if they're you know, 12 or under, I strongly suggest that we break testing up over a couple of days. Testing should be done in the morning when brains are fresh after they've had a good night's sleep. Um, for my college students and my high school students, I often, within parameters, I let them tell me what time they want to start. So my brain might be fresh and ready at 8 or 9 a.m., but a high school or college student developmentally is probably not fresh until 10 or 11, if maybe not a little bit later. So I tell them, you tell me when your brain is freshest, and I want to be the first thing you do in the morning when you get up. So I have a lot of students who are scheduled for the summer now, and we're not starting until 10 a.m. So I'll be going in and getting my emails done and things like that early, and then I'll start testing at 10. Um, because again, you want a fresh brain. But I would be really clear with the evaluator that I want testing of phonological processing, not just reading comprehension, not just individual word reading. Can you please do what we call the CTOP, Comprehensive Test of Phonological Processing? It doesn't even take an hour. I mean, it might be 40 minutes, depending. Um, break it up, have lots of breaks in there. Um, but if we can look for both ADHD and phonological processing deficits, we're already uh, well into diagnosing if both of those conditions are there. Next, if the child is diagnosed with one, but you still suspect that more is going on, which is the term I hear from parents all the time, please, 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 please do not wait. Do not wait. If your child is diagnosed with ADHD and you don't think that they're learning how to read um, accurately and fluently on time, don't let anybody tell you otherwise, go get an evaluation. And this is critical because um, there's, there, children with dyslexia are not going to learn how to read if just given another year of the same kind of instruction. If teaching them like this didn't do it the first time, teaching them like this isn't gonna do it the second time. We know this about dyslexia. Dyslexic brains need a specific type of instruction multi-sensory structured literacy, which I'll talk about in a minute. So do not let time lapse. Do not kick the can down the road. Do not have them repeat another year of first grade or third grade or whatever. Get an evaluation to see if dyslexia might be there. Keep asking questions. This is not something that they'll just grow out of if we're talking about dyslexia. Remember, ask your evaluator if they are versed in both. And remember, it's not unusual for a person to have both conditions. And so a lot of times parents will sort of discount or teachers will discount their own impressions because they'll say something like, well, it's probably just all the ADHD or, I mean, he's already got ADHD. How likely is it that he's going to have dyslexia as well? Um, it's pretty likely. So please, please, please knock on doors, write letters, um, you know, ask, ask, ask to have your child's phonological processing looked at as well. Or if the child is diagnosed with dyslexia and you're still concerned about the attention piece, ask. Now, the way that I advise families is um, ask the evaluator. So certainly ask the evaluator, are you experienced in diagnosing ADHD and dyslexia and the overlap between the two? That's an easy question to ask. I'm not afraid to ask what, what organizations they are members of. I think if you have an evaluator that's a member of the International Dyslexia Association, the Learning Disabilities Association of America, um, if they're members of children and adults with ADD, if they're members of LDA, there's a variety of organizations, but I like the members, the evaluators who are members of the International Dyslexia Association, because I feel like they, they're up on what they're doing and they know what the research is currently. IDA does a great job of getting the word out. So if you have a child diagnosed with 
um, ADHD and you want an evaluation for dyslexia as well, um, just ask what memberships they're, um, they're, what organizations, I'm sorry, they're members of. It's a good way to, instead of, like I have people write me letters all the time and saying, you know, this sort of long um, list of all these questions. And if I answer those questions, it'll probably take me about two hours. Um, but I tell them I'm a member, I'm an active member of IDA. I speak for their conferences regularly. Um, I attend the conferences annually. I am up to speed on, I, on dyslexia. That's usually all they need to hear. Remember, a child with both conditions will have both symptom clusters. They will have the inattention or impulsivity, and they will have the phonological awareness issues. And so if you have a child that just has one or the other, you're not going to see both symptom clusters, not at diagnosable levels. Okay, so rounding the corner, what do you do to know if a child's diagnosed with both? What are key things to know if your child is diagnosed with both? Addressing one without addressing the other isn't going to make them both go away. If your child is diagnosed with ADHD and you put them on medication, it's not going to make their reading better. Um, they may be able to pay attention longer to reading and they may have a little bit better working memory, but they're not going to be able to apply their phonemic awareness skills and unlock a code to a word they don't know because they're on ADHD meds. So brains with dyslexia need to be taught how to read differently. And then conversely, if a child is going through dyslexia treatment, it's not magically going to make their ADHD better if it's a true ADHD diagnosis. If we're talking about inattention because they're having a hard time doing worksheets at school and now they can do worksheets at school, that might be the case. But that wouldn't be ADHD. That would be inattention secondary to uh, language processing problems. Multi-century structured literacy does not make the attention weaknesses go away. That's what I was just saying. So you may see some improvement. They may be able to comprehend a little bit better, or they may be able to sit in school a little bit longer and persist, but you're not going to see that other symptom cluster just magically go away. Both conditions need to be addressed and treated, and they both need to be on school documentation. And addressing only one can actually result in the interventions or strategies for the other one being ineffective. So if I'm addressing ADHD, but I'm not addressing dyslexia, what I'm doing for ADHD may be ineffective because I'm not addressing both. So for example, one of the things that we recommend for students with um, ADHD is make them lists and give them templates and planners and software and all these other things. But if they cannot read, they're not able to benefit from the list, from the template, from the planner, from the software or the apps. So if they're not decoding, these things that we often recommend for ADHD aren't going to be helpful. And if a child is very impulsive and struggling with in, intensive um, weaknesses in their um, focusing and attention and whatnot, tutoring sessions may be long and tiring. And so a child who cannot manage their impulses may struggle with the intensive and fatiguing tutoring sessions that are needed to teach a child with dyslexia to read or to follow along with an audiobook or to learn a new assistive technology. So if we're only addressing the dyslexia symptoms without the ADHD, they may not benefit very much from the multisensory structured literacy or other things because they're having a hard time focusing and paying attention. ADHD is associated with cognitive difficulties such as working memory deficits. So the therapies for dyslexia may progress slower and it may take longer for the child to learn and acquire the phonological processing strategies that they're being taught. Please be sure the academic language therapist is experienced in working with children who have both conditions. And good reading specialists will tell you, yeah, if a child has ADHD, I definitely need to tweak what I'm doing. We might have shorter sessions. We might meet more frequently, but for shorter durations. I know I have to spiral back more often. I know we have to move on from concepts a little bit quicker and then come back to them. I know I have to be very active in the session versus more passive in the session. It's a lot of work for a reading therapist, um, a certified academic language therapist. Once the basics of reading are taught to the point of fluency though, there may still be lingering reading issues related to comprehension. I hinted at this before, the working memory weaknesses that we often see with ADHD can still lead to reading comprehension difficulties. 
So two points here. Number one, be on the lookout for ongoing reading issues, even after the student may have done well in their dyslexia remediation. And number two, there are other reading disorders that are not dyslexia. And so a reading comprehension disorder may still exist, even if the dyslexia is remediated or if the student just has ADHD and is struggling with comprehension, but can unlock individual words. Let me say that again. Number one, be on the lookout for ongoing reading issues even after dyslexia is treated. And number two, children with ADHD may struggle with reading comprehension because of the ADHD attention element. So always be on the lookout for that. Tools and strategies to address ADHD will need to be less reading heavy. For example, use picture lists, visual planners, rather than a word list or a traditional planner. And by the way, make sure that you're checking what the child writes in their planner for accuracy. Accurately copying off the board is very difficult for kids with ADHD and kids with dyslexia. So don't just assume, I told him to put it in his planner, the homework was written on the board, check it with your eyeballs or have a peer check it and make sure it is written in there accurately. They may still struggle with writing even once the spelling improves. And so be ready, even with good dyslexia remediation, they still may need help with punctuation, organization, proofreading and things like that. But please, I know this sounds a little bit heavy, but be optimistic because we know that with appropriate support and accommodation, folks with both conditions can go on to be very successful. It's never too late to diagnose those disorders or to receive help. Like I said, I've seen folks in their 70s that I'm diagnosing for the first time with these conditions. Folks who are trying to go back to medical school, trying to go back to law school, trying to go back to paramedic school, trying to go back and be firefighters, or <coughs> even um, I've had people who are successful in their business before the pandemic, and then the shift to so much email has resulted in them really, really struggling because they were great face-to-face, -face, but now everything email, they're struggling with the language components. So don't be afraid to ask. It's possible to learn and develop strengths and then go on and be a happy, help, healthy, productive human in society. And then I have some additional resources for you if you wanna dig up any of these or feel free to go to my website. I've got lots of free videos on there, talks I've given or things that you can watch. You can also contact me through the website as well. Okay, so I'm opening it up for questions now. Terrific. That was a really wonderful, helpful, totally engaging, informative webinar. Thank you so much. And we got great questions. Excellent. Um, before we start the Q&A, I'd like to thank Accenture once more for sponsoring this webinar. Okay, let's get to the questions. Um, at what age should a child be di diagnosed with dyslexia? Is there a particular age or um, what do you suggest? So the evidence for dyslexia is they're very young. Um, first and foremost, if there is a family history, absolutely get them evaluated like preschool, kindergarten even, don't be afraid. Um, there are pre-reading skills that we know um, correlate with later reading difficulties. In fact, there was a study that was done and this isn't widespread in terms of being able to go and get it done yourself, but they did a study where they put these adorable little earphones on newborns in the nursery. And they had a pacifier that was wired to a computer. And so through the earphones, they would make a sound like puh, 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 puh. And so the little one would be listening in the earphones and after, so they start sucking on the pacifier and after they've heard it a bunch of times, they do what we call habituate to it. So they just go sucking on the pacifier while the, the earphones are going puh, puh, puh. And then they switch the phoneme and they go buh. And the little one will be going and they stop sucking on the pacifier because they noticed there was a difference in the phoneme. The fact that a newborn can notice the difference in a phoneme has been tied to later reading difficulties or not being able to hear the difference in a phoneme, I should say. So an inability to notice a different phoneme is tied to later reading difficulties in newborns. So absolutely, we can evaluate kids at very young ages. We can look at what we call rapid naming. We can look at pre-language skills, pre-reading skills at very young ages. So if there's a family history, I would say start knocking on somebody's door, kindergarten, preschool even. Um, later than that, never. it's never too late to get evaluated, but if there's not a family history and you're still not sure, 
I wouldn't let it go much beyond first grade. Okay, great. Um, another person asks, what are some suggestions for how I can talk to my child about being diagnosed with ADHD and dyslexia? Fantastic question. The first thing I'm thinking of is how old's the kiddo? Um, so keep it developmentally appropriate. Uh, you know, there are some books out there about both of them that are written for children and that are written to be read with children. Um, some of the highlights that I try to stress for children are uh, number one, everybody's brain is different. Everybody's brain is different. So there's a book out there called How We Are Smart. Sometimes I just read that with kids and it talks about different ways of being intelligent, right? So you can be a good dancer, you can be um, good with words, you can be uh, great with math or a scientist, right? So sometimes I'll just introduce that concept to kids about how everybody's brain is different and how we are smart. And then I tell them that um, I lead in with some of their strengths. Like you are such a great friend and you are such a great big sister. Um, and you know, your brother is lost without you and he loves playing with you. So I lead in with their strengths. And then I try to get their observations, especially when it's a kiddo in my practice who I don't know very well. So I'll ask them like, what do you, what do you really enjoy? What do you find that you're really good at? What do you, what do you flow with when you're doing it? So like I swim and I love swimming or horseback riding or whatever. So we talk about that. And then I'll ask them like, what feels really hard for you? Um, and then oftentimes kids have an awareness of what feels hard for them and what is hard for them. I don't plant the seed, but I, um, I kind of put names to the seeds that they've already told me. And I get a lot of information from the parents as well. And so I'll say something like, you know how when you're in Mrs. Patterson's class and it feels like mom was telling me that it feels like everything's kind of going so fast. Um, part of that is because, and then I will describe like there's something called ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or there's something called dyslexia. And it's just a difference in how your brain works. And I really focus on it's a diversity rather than a disability at the young ages. As kids get older, I'm not afraid to say, so it makes things harder for you, which just means you're going to have to work a little bit harder. So they're not off the hook, but they're, um, they're validated in their experiences. And then I assure them, because this is the truth, and I do not lie to kids, we know what to do with these conditions. There's a lot of people out here to help us. And we will work till you know the ends of the earth to find the people that are gonna help you and that are gonna help you meet the goals that you wanna meet. Something like that. Strengths, summarizing based on their own words, what their challenges are, putting names to those challenges, but keeping it developmentally appropriate. Don't dig too deep into it if they're little, but if they're older, you know, get them books, get them. My son actually has a, a writing disorder and he went with me to IDA one year and he went to meetings and conferences himself. And he came and told me about it. And he was, I think, 13 at the time, maybe even 12. So get them involved in organizations. And then also, and always, playing up their strengths and letting them know that no matter what, you will always love them and be there for them. And it's not about ADHD or whatnot. It's about who they are. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, if a child is already taking ADHD medication, do you recommend that they be tested for dyslexia with or without their medication? So not being an MD, a medical doctor, I have a PhD, I have to be careful about talking about medicine, but I'll tell you the, the rule of thumb is you generally test them on meds, you test them how they would go to school. You want the best brain possible in front of you. If they're going to have phonological awareness difficulties, they'll have them on or off meds. If you want to get at just how inattentive they are and what role the inattention can play in the reading process, then I have them come back twice. I get permission from the physician. I talk to the physician. I talk to the family. We talk about how long they need to be off the meds or whatnot to get a true measure of what they are like naked of that treatment. Um, but I test on meds. It's pretty much a, a general rule. You want to get the best the child's capable of. And then if they test beautifully, but they're still struggling at school, that's a slightly different question to answer. Okay. I have two questions from different adults um, that are related. So one wants to know, is this a condition, is dyslexia a condition you should tell your employer? And what 
do you believe are the most helpful approaches or ad adaptations for adults in the workplace? It really depends on your employer and it depends on what you need. So I've done disability determination for adults in the workplace. And um, one adult that I just saw last summer worked for a large multi uh, international company. And there was HR paperwork documented what needed to be said, how it needed to be said and all of that. So the first thing is if you are going to disclose, make sure you go to an evaluator who knows what they're doing with this. Um, I'm actually really busy up here in Cleveland with a lot of that because a lot of people don't want to mess with it. It has to be written a certain way. Um, there has to be, it has to be written in compliance with the law so that you not only it, have a diagnosis. So it might say that Susie has dyslexia, reading is hard for her. Please give her accommodations. No, you have to show your data. You have to show how that demonstrates it's dyslexia. You have to not only say it's dyslexia, but it's having a functional impact in exactly what areas. So difficulty answering and reading emails because of phonological awareness or something. Then you have to make the recommendations that you make and tie them specifically to the disorder. So, you know, I can't say like she's allowed to bring a puppy to work because she has a hard time reading emails. No, but I can say that she needs to have talk to text software, which will help her writing emails and then an extra sentence on that. So there's some legalities in there. I would disclose after careful consideration and consulting with um, a disability attorney or and a psychologist and really thinking it through because once it's out there, it's out there. Um, on the other hand, um, accommodations, particularly if we're talking about dyslexia, um, are relatively simple. And a lot of times you can do them yourself. So you can get talk to text software or you can get text to speech uh, um, software, or you can find things online that will read um, web pages to you, for example. So there are a lot of resources available out there to help you work around the print-based piece. Where I've needed to really get involved is if it was somebody who does a lot of writing of reports, like an attorney who does briefs or things like that. So really working with the employer to try to find ways to kind of limit the writing requirements or minimize the writing requirements. Um, if it's ADHD, I would be very, very careful about talking to your boss or your employer about this unless you consult with someone else. Um, consult with somebody in um, you know, disability law um, before you talk to anybody about it. It is misunderstood and there's a lot of stigmas around it. Um, in terms of accommodations, things like dyslexia, Technology, 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 and technology. Ta um, talk to text software, text to speech software, um, extra time, maybe slightly light and load, depending on how much writing you have to do. Um, those would be some of the major things. But again, everyone's dyslexia is a little bit different. So if one person has an oral language difficulty that is a piece of their dyslexia, then there might be recommendations based on face to face meetings being recorded or things like that. In terms of ADHD, some of the major recommendations that I um, include are, are things that you all probably know already. So, you know, work periods that include a lot of breaks, a lot of movement breaks, getting up and moving around. There may need to be flexibility in the workday um, so that, you know, you don't mind working like a nine hour day, but you take a lot of breaks in between. Or your work periods coincide with your most, um, your most efficient pieces of the day. So maybe you're a late night worker or you're an early morning worker. And so some of that flexibility, if it is reasonable uh, for the employer are things that you would be asking for. And there are tons of things online. If you just look uh, accommodations for dyslexia in the workplace or accommodations for ADHD in the workplace, there will be tons of ideas on there. And you can just use it like a toolbox, like maybe I'll try this one and, and perhaps this one will work for me. Okay, we have time for one more question. Do you have strategies for getting teachers to respect a child's 504 plan? My child is charismatic and intelligent, so they don't understand she's truly struggling. Mm. I will tell you one of the things um, that has worked in my experience. I have parents write a letter, parents of the families I serve write a letter, um, kind of like introdu introduction to my kid. And uh, just a one page and they give it to the teachers at the beginning of the school year. Hey, this is my kiddo. Um, and in this case, I would say something like, you know, she's got a lot of great strengths. However, those strengths can overshadow the areas of weakness. And I just wanna make sure that you are aware of both. 
because we don't want undue anxiety or stress. Um, I back it up with an article or two that's printed out from an organization about what is dyslexia or what is dysgraphia or what is ADHD or whatnot, um, so that they know this just isn't some mom coming up with this, like this is what a professional says. Remember, teachers often don't have access to the neuropsych report or to the psychological report that's written. And um, teachers, they don't have any specific training, most of them, uh, gen ed teachers for sure, in what these conditions are. So they think if it's not you know, a five-year-old boy who's had three trips to the ER in the last year and has two broken arms, it must not be ADHD and that's false. So find an article that describes what you're trying to get your point across. Girls with ADHD, there's plenty of articles on that, for example. And then don't be afraid to find a psychologist in the community or uh, consult with somebody in the community who's willing to come in and talk at a meeting. I go to lots of IEP and 504 special ed meetings. I've gone in on behalf of families all the time and done something just like this. I've gone to administrators and said, you know what, I'd like to put on a seminar. What, is there a day or a time that I can come and talk at the school? And so don't be afraid to ask a more knowledgeable person who's got some credentials and fancy letters after their name to come in and maybe gently or not so gently remind the teacher that they're violating your child's rights and that this condition is here and what do we need to be doing about it? Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Chase, for joining us today and for sharing your expertise with our ADHD community. Really appreciate all the helpful information. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was an absolute joy. Okay. Um, next week's webinar, unfortunately, uh, has been canceled. That was the biology of ADHD and medication options for treatment with Dr. Joseph Biderman. Um, so stay tuned um, for our next uh, webinar and make sure you don't miss future Attitude webinars, articles, or research updates by signing up to receive our free email newsletters at attitudemag.com newsletters. Thank you.